Car of the Year awards appear to be dead or near death here in Australia across nearly all publishers. Now, I'm not particularly going to miss any Car of the Year award. They were entertainingly misguided, of course, and therefore quite easy to roast. The gags just wrote themselves. But on balance, you know, deeper down at a more substantive level, these awards are preposterously worthless if you actually need guidance on what's the right new car for you. I'm Logan from AutoExpert.com.au. New cars cheap, but Australia only. Website. Card. Let's start with wheels, shall we? Wheels Car of the Year 2023 continued their proud tradition of self satirization by not actually being a car. Remember? <laughs> it was the Ford Everest when that was announced on the 7th of March 2023. So, to me, looking at my calendar ever so briefly, it seems like Wheels 2024 Car of the Year is a little late, doesn't it? And when you add the complete lack of reference to or promotion of any Wheels Car of the Year for 2024, like, dude, don't mention the war on their website or anywhere else that I could find, and the fact that Wheels has been for sale for six months or so with not a buyer in sight, seemingly, suggests to me that 2023 might well have been the last ever Wheels Car of the Year. Hilarious winners from Wheels over the past half century or so included the Renault 12, such a beautiful car, Leyland P76, you could fit a 44-gallon drum in the boot, dude, the Holden JB Camira, be still my beating heart, the beautiful Mitsubishi Nimbus, Holden Barina, BMW i3, Volvo XC60, three-prong EQC, and the Kia EV6. Beacons of irrelevance and or also, at times at least, complete lemon-scented shit heaps through the prism of history, certainly. I'm sure they had their reasons at the time, dude, for these various awards, but Wheels is not the only publication whose car of the year appears to have been on a recent date with Dr Kevorkian. Don't worry, dude, you'll be back to the main report before you know it, but Olight is a fantastic sponsor of this channel. I've been with them and Vicky Verka for donkey's years now, and that's mainly because I love their product. I mean, my other website should be torch.pervert, but I do feel naked if, at least from the waist down, if I happen to go out without my favourite EDC flashlight, which is this highly worn and somewhat abused Warrior Mini 2. I love this torch. It's got a tail switch on the back. It's super bright. It's got a switch on the barrel for sort of fine work, you know, and if you're not used to using a torch, they're so useful all around the place, not just at night. Like, you drop something in your fat cave and it rolls under the bench. Finding it is a whole lot easier with one of these. Anyway, if you go to Olight's website, the main problem that confounds you is the burden of choice. Because there's like dozens of friggin' lights. And what I want to do is break this down for you the better for you to capitalise on the mad discounts right now and also make the choice that's right for you. So here are my favourites. I'm a super fan of anything with the word warrior in it, not just because of the word, but because of what this range represents in terms of toughness, durability and all-round EDC, like everyday carry versatility. So my favourite that normally lives in my pocket. The smallest entrant is this thing here. It's called the Warrior Nano. And obviously, it's just a tiny version of my favourite. And that means not quite as bright, doesn't last quite as long in terms of battery endurance, but it's got all the other features. It's got the tactical tail switch. It's got the switch on the barrel as well for the finer work. So it operates in exactly the same way. It's got the pocket clip, and you're not going to feel it in your pocket. I don't feel this. 
I feel its absence if I make a mistake and go out without it. Don't worry about that. But my favourite has been uh, superseded by this Warrior Mini 3, which is kind of brighter and it's got a slightly better tail switch. It's kind of shorter, but in every other respect, it's functionally the same. And for me, this is just the perfect size because there's no real impediment to going out and carrying it. You know, if you've got a dirty big torch, it, it's not going to feel all that comfortable in your pocket, is it? And that is a disincentive to carry it. And if you find yourself in a situation where you really need a torch and you're not carrying it, well, that's a bit of a bastard, isn't it? So, Warrior Mini 3. Super useful. If you've only got one torch, I can thoroughly recommend it because its predecessor has never let me down. Then you can step up from the Mini 3 to the Warrior 3S, which is more like one of these on steroids. Like, if there's going to be a zombie apocalypse, if you watch the weather forecast and they said 80% chance of zombie apocalypse get the 3S because it's just a bigger version but it does everything the same. So it's brighter and just beefier in the hand. It's kind of pocketable but I'd feel more comfortable with it in my handbag, for example. It's just a really good solid torch that's the same thing as we've already discussed, only bigger. And these things are all IPX8 as well, so, and they're drop tested to like 1.5 or 2 meters or something. I've been spectacularly unable to kill my Mini 2, despite several attempts, off ladders and wherever, right? So they are pretty tough and they're not full of it when it comes to these ratings. You're not going to drown it, you're not going to drop it and kill it in normal use, not at all. And you get these two brightness levels, you get pretty bright and then, Jesus, plus you still got your tail switch, your barrel switch, sorry, functionality, which is kind of important. Now, if the Bureau issues an urgent zombie apocalypse warning and it's almost certain that a proper zombie apocalypse is coming through, then the Warrior 3X is the next logical iteration. Now, it's not pocketable. It's kind of too big for that. It's got a couple of really cool features, though. Like, check those out. See those three dots on the bezel there? They're actually zirconium beads, and they're designed to breach windows, specifically the tempered glass windows in a car. Now, if you ever need to rescue someone or a pet or something, like a kid or a pet trapped in a hot car, somebody's in real danger following a car crash, although injured persons should be left in cars until paramedical support arrives, unless there is imminent danger and you have to act. But if you ever need to breach a window just to get through to support somebody who's injured in a car or rescue that pet, look for the corner near the pillar up the top because... In a tempered glass window, that's where the stresses from tempering are the poorest resolved. So it's easier to break the window by near the corner than it is where everyone who doesn't understand that would normally attempt it, which is in the middle of the window. Don't do that. The stresses are very well resolved from the tempering process in the middle of the window and very poor up there in that 90 degree corner near the pillar. So just the other thing is give it a percussive hit rather than like you you're not trying to punch the torch through into the next postcode if you do it that way you're likely to follow through and you could easily cut yourself to ribbons on any glass that remains even though there will be that sort of prince rupert's drop of catastrophic failure it might still be there and intact enough to cut you if you know what i mean so anyway the other thing about buying a dirty big torch like this 3x is that you lose the barrel switch functionality for the fine work right it's just bright and jesus that's bright so there's that couple of specials oh no we'll do this one first if you've got a workshop like a fat cave or a car and i'm tipping you know you're watching this channel so you've probably got both this thing is called a swivel and it is flat out brilliant it's great for the car and great for a workshop because if you need a portable light for a, I don't know, bandsaw or a drill press, you can just, it's magnetic. So 
it just sticks to whatever vertical surfaces it sticks and you know uh, horizontal surfaces inverted it sticks and if there's a convenient hook like you know the latching mechanism for your bonnet which is a hood in America then carabiner dude magnets on the back angle adjustment it's a work light which is kind of cool and you can vary the brightness there but if you press and hold oh my god it's also a torch so if that's just not mad multi-functionality I don't know what is and they're normally only about 40 bucks so impact resistant plastic absolutely brilliant the specials Arkfeld Pro which is a low power laser pointer with a torch conventional torch and a UV light so you switch between those modes just like that which is hard to do when you're not looking at it and the three different globes there just changes in between them now unfortunately racy stripes are sold out but you can get an unstripy Arkfeld Pro right now the difference between this and previous Arkfelds is it's kind of brighter and better all of these torches with the exception of the swivel magnetic base recharging so if you've got three O lights for example and why wouldn't you you can have a charger like this which is USB on this side USB-A on that side um, you can have that in your office in your fat cave in your car whatever you can have them wherever you need them and they're compatible with all of your torches which is very cool indeed this is USB-C by the way swivel so everyone's got USB-C just plug it in Bob's your mother's brother the batteries last forever in normal use for all these torches now finally the Seeker 4 Pro this is interesting to me if you are that outdoor pursuit dude because it's optimized for that camping and bushwalking and things of that nature it's got these four you can see them there it's got these four Osram LEDs in the pointy end and they are designed to work with the lens to give you this ball of soft campfire campsite light which is kind of clever I'd have to say it's really good it's also got a switch that cannot acti accidentally be activated you need to rotate it a little bit before you can press it on there's a timer and if it's in your bag and it gets pressed it's not going to flatten itself or heat itself up in your bag which is really cool and you probably noticed then too kind of stepless dimming which is nice so you can have it in your tent for a bit of soft glow whatever and then if you need to find something at longer range you can crank the brightness up and do that and it comes together with this belt clip, this modular plastic belt clip that is a really brilliant piece of industrial design because the grip on the belt is super secure. It's not coming off. You can be hanging by your ankles, um, giving up your address or whatever else. At least your torch isn't going to fall off your belt, dude, right? And magnetic charging for this baby too. But when it's in the holster... USB-C recharging which is an extremely clever adaptation uh, sort of add-on to their traditional you know uh, charging system with the magnetic base so that's very clever this is super lightweight you can't pocket a torch this big so you need a decent way to hang it on your belt or you could hang it on the outside of a pack with a molly system or whatever It'd be really good for that and if you are that outdoors dude then perhaps this is the right torch for you but anyway i won't detain you any longer but the sale ends on the 19th at midnight if you're watching i don't know 400 freaking years in the future or at any other time after the sale i'll put some details in the description with a code or a link whatever so that you can get 12 percent off after the sale winds up all right thanks to olight for sponsoring the video Back to the main report. Of course, the RAC whatevers and the NRMA, like the Motorists Organisations, Team Roadside Assist, they all used to jump in the hot tub together once a year and nut out, so to speak, Australia's so-called best cars, in which 
everyone got a prize, seemingly. And this was always quite interesting to me to see their determinations because they don't accept car maker advertising. And that kind of fundamentally changes everything, right? Unfortunately, though, Australia's best cars seems to have bit the bullet and pushed up daisies, gone out and joined the choir invisible as well. Just like the Motor Show, dude. Remember that? That was a few years ago now, wasn't it? It's got to be a cost thing, okay? Very hard to see anyone do a Car of the Year award properly without spending, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand bucks. It's a big, expensive, arduous job if you do it right. Which brings us to the blemish on Nine Entertainment's ass also known as drive.com.au, formerly Car Advice, purchased for 68 million bucks and then summarily executed. Such strategic organisational brilliance. Drive swam against the prevailing tide of Car of the Year up anus disappearance and actually did one last year, this year, whatever. Recently. They did one recently. An epic, and some would say absurd, winner too. Thanks very much for that. The preposterously resource-intensive abomination wrapped in green virtue, more commonly referred to as the Kia EV9. A triumph of epic out of touchedness there. Allegedly the future of family-friendly zero-emissions motoring. Well done, drive and of course, thanks for the laughs. But to me, even there with that award, everything was not as it seemed for the Drive Car of the Year in 2023. This latest one seemed, essentially, to me at least, a little bit like skim milk pretending to be actual milk. Hashtag Ron Swanson, living legend, dude. Look him up. Here are some images representing the overall flavour of Drive Cars of the Year from 2019 to 2022 inclusive. And if you go looking, there are many more just like that, okay? Now, in contrast, here's one that's more emblematic of their more recent 2023 event. Can you spot the difference? It's pretty obvious. 2019 and 2022 had a shit ton of contenders on a racetrack or at a proving ground. 2023, though, 18 winners in a shed, dude. A very nice shed. Like, I would like that shed. I fair income would. But it's not exactly a facility where one can test cars, is it? Now... I've worked in motoring media since the 1990s. I was, I don't know, features editor for Wheels and Motor. I was editor of Car Advice. I was chief motoring masturbator for Channel 7 and Channel 9 and Radio 2UE. And that makes me very fucking old indeed, dude. So, I think I know how this works by now, but perhaps that just makes me somewhat self-deluded and also somewhat pre- presumptuous. I suppose you could drop a hundred grand or so on a test track for a week and all the related logistics, the catering, the accommodation, the flights, for sake, and then you could take the editorial decision just not to film or photograph any of that at all. But I would also argue, on the balance of probability, that if you got all the contenders on a track, it would be far too visually compelling not to cover them visually there on the track. Okay, Not covering it would be a preposterously wasted opportunity. You'd be fucking insane, now that I think about it, not to milk it for all it's worth visually. Testing in this way at a facility with a track legitimizes the diligence and the depth of your bullshit car of the year award, does it not? It's also a means of exposing all the judges to all the contenders in the same place and under the same conditions, back to back. We call that experimental control. And it is kind of important. You'd have to be batshit crazy not to film them doing that if they actually did it. And yet, 
There are no such images in the latest drive car of the year package, at least not that I could find. And I did go and have what I think was a pretty good look. So I'm tipping the most logical explanation for the absence of any such visual collateral depicting that kind of back-to-back -back on track evaluation that apparently underpinned previous Drive Cars of the Year awards is completely fucking absent this year. Completely. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I doubt it. It seems to me that they pocketed the hundred grand or whatever and they went a different, far cheaper way this time around. Behind me are the best cars that you can buy in Australia right now. Yeah, 18 cars in a shed, dude. Admittedly an awfully nice shed, but it's not several dozen finalists being thrashed mercilessly on a track by expert thrashers, is it? James Ward speaking there. He's drives head, torso and pelvis of content, but not its arms or its legs or its wedding vegetables. In a fascinating video there, explaining exactly how Drive's most recent Car of the Year award actually worked under the hood. I'll put a link to that video and their main Car of the Year pages in the description so you can go out and see for yourself and determine if you think I'm misrepresenting all of this. And also because they need the views. Hashtag sympathy. These are the cars that make up the field of the 2024 Drive Car of the Year Award. No, they're not. Or to be fair, if they are the field, it's a pretty and small field, dude. Looks like a collection of finalists or winners to me in a shed. A very nice shed. But what would I know? According to Wardy, over the past year, drive dudes and dudettes had their asses in over 700 new cars. No word on the rest of their anatomies, but hey, who kept count, I wonder? Perhaps there's an ass seat interaction app. It probably is. Yay for them and their multi-vehicular asses, I say. Well done. Apparently, they and or their asses make notes, etc. Also, throughout the year, diligently testing, just like science, only minus the experimental control, which is kind of critical. The team members who have driven the cars present their assessments, which is then combined with all the data into one master spreadsheet. Two important points on this one. It sounds like not all the judges drive all the contenders throughout the year, and there's no evidence that I can find that they do so during the Car of the Year event. Driving every car during the year would seem impossible to me in practice. 365 days minus 104 days for the weekends minus 10 public holidays and 20 annual leave days equals, take away the number you first thought of, 231 work days. And if you awaken one fateful day throughout the year and your nuts are kind of sore and you take a sickie, fair enough, dude, or do debt, free country, call it 230 work days broadly every year. So if there are 230 make model variant contenders, every judge would have to drive a different car every workday on average to taste test all of the contenders and not just to and fro the office, dude, because that's not testing a car. That's wasting your life in traffic. A car every day, testing a car every day. How would they ever get anything else done? such as, I don't know, um, writing a story or going on a launch or making unwatchable videos, whatever. Seemingly, instead of getting the core contenders of several dozen vehicles that qualify for car of the year eligibility together on a track or a proving ground or something, so all the judges can sample them back to back in the same controlled conditions, it appears instead they just had a meeting and formulated a spreadsheet, a master spreadsheet, to be fair. And fair enough, dude, like there were no laws that were broken that we know of. It's allowed, therefore you can do that, free country and all, but let's say you're a judge and you drove a Santa Fe in New South Wales last January and then a Kluger in Queensland in, I don't know, June or something, and a Sorrento in Victoria in September. How reliable are your comparative determinations going to be benchmarking 
Relative ride quality, comfort, noise, control architecture and feedback, etc. Different places at different times on different roads in different conditions like summer, winter, wet, dry, whatever. And you've driven dozens of other cars in between. I know you've got notes, but it's very hard to get that kind of comparative benchmarking right in ideal conditions. There's a lot of talent in the room with the judges, admittedly, but still, it's almost impossible to do that. A shortlist is made and then everyone casts their own vote that once tallied, decides each category winner. Okay, so that's pretty clear. Instead of driving the contenders back to back, it appears they sit around a spreadsheet, sorry, a master spreadsheet, and vote. And as a result of the votes. So when all the category winners have been decided, the entire team and all the cars gather for an intensive production week. To me, that's kind of the tail wagging the dog, which is so 21st century now that I think about it. Drive's Car of the Year is sounding to me more like an editorial stunt designed to look like an actual test rather than a rigorous testing process being performed in the field to determine a winner. It seems like a winner and a master spreadsheet with audiovisual embellishment. That's just a personal opinion based on what I know about performing multi-car tests and what I see in their reported coverage. Like, when I did all the handling tests and tyre tests for wheels back in the day, you know, we rode our dinosaurs around the friggin' track. Tyrannosaurus Rex also won despite its little short arms, go figure. The tests came first back then, okay? We also covered it editorially, obviously, because that's the job, and we did some magazine media shit, so setups for photography and things of that nature, but the tests needed to be rigorous, otherwise the reports would have had no frickin' substance. So the test was the priority at the time, and the report was coverage of it. To me, this seems like the coverage, and no test, like a dramatisation of Car of the Year. The wonder bra, perhaps, of Cars of the Year. It looks awesome, nice presentation, dude. But when you undo the clasp, where did the testing actually go? Beyond this, the off-road category winners are taken out into the bush for crucial dynamic content creation. Crucial dynamic content creation, really. To me, that sounds like going out on location and shooting some video designed to look like rigorous evaluation after the winners had already been determined, thanks to the spreadsheet meeting. Master spreadsheet meeting, sorry. It sounds to me really like they're striving to legitimise a spreadsheet meeting by creating crucially dynamic content. We give you all the details, all the photos, all the data and all the tips to make sure your next car is one of the very best. Indeed, dude. Drive car of the year seems to me like 18 cars in a shed following a meeting with a master spreadsheet and a handful of off-roaders appearing to be put through their paces after the winners were determined. Don't get me wrong on this. Some of those judges are highly talented and experienced dudes and, of course, dudettes. They know their shit, right? They know their way around a car. They have a lot of experience and a lot of credibility, and I have some respect for them. But Cars of the Year are supposed to be important awards, and this seems like such a substantial, fundamental change. And I would argue not for the better, okay? It therefore deserves oxygenation, and we should have a debate about that, right? Because kind of important, millions of dollars worth of sales purportedly ride on these kinds of things, and that's perhaps reason enough. And for fairness, in terms of kicking this discussion off, I cut to their head, torso, and pelvis of content to explain how they did it, right? You can watch the whole video to make sure that I'm not just cherry picking just to roast them, okay? Like part of it is a roast, obviously, but there's a serious undercurrent to all of this as well, apropos of the future of awards of these natures. Now, I don't want to be too hard on them either. Like, 
at least they're still doing a car of the year. And that's still a relatively expensive, detailed undertaking, right? And look, dude, editorial content is fucking expensive. Like, just the cost of sending a journal on a launch is a balance sheet black hole two or three days away, and then they go back to the office with essentially nothing tangible to show for it. It's going to take, I don't know, another day to write a review and another day to write a script for a video and record the VO, brief the editor, whatever. So about four days to cover one new car minimum, even longer if it's overseas, you know, even a road test. Like you can put four cars out on the road and test them. You need four people and probably someone to detail them and a photographer and a couple of days on the road. And it's just the never ending story of cost. Very hard to turn any of that black on the balance sheet, I'd suggest. And even harder with a car of the year award, even a watered down one, even a skim milk car of the year. The intern, frankly, has to write a sh rewrite, a shit ton of batshit boring press releases pretending to be news to compensate for having just one relatively senior journo attending a launch, right? Because publishers like Drive need to keep serving up those ads incessantly, especially if the big dogs are away being schmoozed by some company launching a new car. So I kind of get it. You can make car of the year $100,000 cheaper or something by apparently removing the track and the associated testing logistics. And then you also have to strive to make it look like it's still export grade by hiring a nice shed with purple LEDs and a jib and making some compelling content. That's the way media bean counters roll. They cut off your editorial nuts and then they tell you to smile because, dude, you're on in 10. This is how they killed radio and newspapers and how they're killing TV, right? I was there as a frontline witness to the death of radio and it was exactly that. A thousand cuts. It seems to me that this choice also removed a major chunk of what made the Drive Award credible. Okay, this choice to remove the track, seemingly. Incidentally, I did also speak to several people in car companies off the record. They told me that there was no demand for dozens of cars for comparative testing at around the time Drive did the award, specifically for Car of the Year, this year, as there had been typically in previous years. Like, it was an onerous burden for car makers all to stump up the large number of cars required at the same time, okay? That didn't happen, apparently, at least not to the car makers I spoke to. I went looking for evidence of actual testing, and I drew a complete blank, in other words. I'm pretty sure there was no back-to-back -back track test. There's no pictures, and everything I investigated told me that it didn't happen. So I'm going to roll with that. And I'd further argue, once you head down this no track track of Car of the Year, things can only get worse, can't they? What's the next step in this bean counter driven editorial cost cutting process? Can you think of one? Because I know how to make it even cheaper next year. It's dead obvious and super easy to implement. Instead of getting 13 or 14 fairly highly paid judges in a room on their knees pumping up a master spreadsheet, you just get ChatGPT to read all of Drive's reviews in 2024 and autonomously decide what next year's car of the year is going to be. You'd have to give the AI some basic parameters, I suppose, like comfort's worth this much and performance, safety, value car maker advertising spend, etc. All of the important variables, in other words. The thing that really confronts me about that is, right, chat GPT might actually do just as good a job as a room full of motoring journalists if all it has to do is filter the year's reviews and decide upon a suitable car of the year. It might even be better than a room full of humans at doing that. Then you just spend, I don't know, a couple of days in the shed, a nice one, making some crucially compelling content. 
almost nobody's going to notice the change. Like, I guarantee it, dude. Did you notice the change in Drive's Car of the Year presentation this year? Because I bet you didn't. I've discussed this with several car company insiders, highly placed ones too, keen observers of the motoring media, and some with really sharp analytical minds. They didn't notice the change either. So I'm kind of looking forward in a way to seeing what ChatGPT can do with Car of the Year in 2025. I got no skin in the game, dude. It's just going to be interesting. It's not like my credibility is going to be riding on it. 